I, I, I try my best to stay clear from the overpriced motherboard, but today I confess I completely failed because I am reviewing a 700 bucks one and an unhealthy part of me absolutely love it. I get to see large companies trying to convince us that their products are worth those inflated price and none does it better than Asus introducing its rug. Hero Refresh, the ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero. Now, fun fact for you, did you know that male porcupines uh, urinate on females before sex? I know this because last week I was told that I was no porcupine. Rug Maximus is this very enthusiastically driven, expensive, premium family of motherboards that uh, Asus has been trying to impose onto the market for the past 15 years. And, and it is where you will find the shine, the specs all at once united for some very expensive bucks. So always a very exciting motherboard to review. And with the 14th generation of Intel Core processor release, we get ourselves a bunch of refreshed Z790 powered motherboards. And I have to admit, some of them really have, you know, strong arguments. Now, starting with the obvious. Unsurprisingly, our Z790 Dark Hero comes with a premium eight-layered PCB ATX board, which means extremely reliable PCIe signal installation and the insurance of a long-lasting product. The fundamentals are here. Design-wise, well, we are in the darkest dark the Dark Hero has ever been into. It's obscure, it's mineral, and it imposes a subtle sense of confidence and strength. Asus is showing off its metal cutting abilities and its care for perfect finish. We get glossy, we got matte brushing, we even got some glass inserts. This looks and feels premium all around. RGB wise, we have a single large and very cared for IO roof OLED screen here to project the ROG logo in your face. And it looks great. I, I do have to admit uh, that it does. But for the ones who need to express their inner Irish potato driven poetry, well, we do have a bunch of aura compliant RGB connectors. Now, CPU circuit wise, for the very last time, we have our departing LGA 1700, which is the first to have supported three consecutive Intel processors and should be remembered as such. VRM wise, because that's where all eyes usually fall on a hero, we do have a solid 2390 amps configuration organized in a 20 plus 2 plus 1 direct phases for a 2070 amps grand total, 1800 of which are CPU centric. A very similar VRM then seen on its Z790 Hero Twin and in all honesty, they both will have identical overclocking abilities. But on the good side, I do want to underline the 10K capacitor, which keeps this motherboard way above the already very sturdy military graded tough series and does comfort that long lifespan feel of the product. Now, cooling wise, well, nothing but the best. We have that very large two VRM block linked by an eight millimeter wide copper pipe to ensure an homogeneous heat spread. The main block is that four stages monster of sanded aluminum topped by a rather large radiating plate. Now the side block is this very good looking thick two level chunk of metal, which not only does a great job at keeping temps at bay, but looks like an artifact from the movie Alien which I love. As usual, both have a double contact design, which ensures a direct intimate thermal padded contact to both chokes and power stages alike. In short, it is a really, really beautifully designed piece of cooling wear and results are unsurprisingly good. With my i9-14900K clocked at 5.9 GHz and after an hour long synthetic stress test, both blocks fared brilliantly and stayed around 50 degrees Celsius for the last half hour of the testing. The only problem here is from the i9 uh, processor itself, which no matter how good your all-in-one cooler is, 
will be struggling at keeping this chip cool even uh, running at stock clock. I mean, 250 to 300 watts footprint is massive, but that is where we can benefit from this board versatility. You can get the EKWB monoblock and completely transform the possibilities of your VRM slash CPU. Not only can you keep your power stages cooler longer, but now we have some thermal leeway to push our i9-14900K to overclocking territories. With a 6.1 GHz constant synthetic stress test, I had no issue keeping below 40 degrees Celsius on the VRM and watch this 80 CPU wise. Just like me, absolutely magic. Overall, uh, I would grade this motherboard eight and a half out of 10. Yes, I'm going uh, numeral now. And I would not see it uh, couple lose anything less than the i7 K class, or even that is a little bit short. I, this is a motherboard who's really been designed for i9s, nothing less. That's that's what I think. RAM rise, we do get our usual 192 GB of DDR5 RAM, organized in a dual channel configuration and clockable up to a rather fast 7000. 800 megahertz, a 200 megahertz bump from the Maximus Z790 Hero, but worth mentioning, 400 megahertz below uh, what the Gigabyte can offer with its Aorus X refresh lineup. But to be fair, a few hundred megahertz up, a few hundred megahertz down, you're not gonna see much of a difference. But where you're gonna see a big difference is if you're going from DDR4 to DDR5, especially when you get around those 8 gigahertz clocks. But again, to be totally honest, it might not be that easy to get to 7.8 gigahertz if you're gonna go for a fully populated dual channel. You might get there with a single stick, but if you're gonna go for the full shebang, six gigahertz and a half, maybe seven is where it is more realistic for you to get to. Now, PCIe export wise. Well, we are in the presence of a proper dual GPU motherboard, which with the PCIe 5.0 standard is especially interesting and future proofing. In a single GPU configuration, only our closest CPU export can output up to 16 PCIe 5.0 lanes worth of bandwidth for a heavy 64 gigabyte per second in each direction. In a dual GPU setup, both our exports share the PCIe 5 available lanes for an 8x8 eight eight bifurcation, more than enough to even support a dual 4090 configuration, hence the metallic reinforcements on both of these slots. I also want to note uh, that we do have the now very famous uh, Asus very own PCIe release mechanism, which they introduced a couple years ago and which is now copied by all of its competition. Now, the last export is a dual slot which can operate at a surprisingly fast four lanes at PCIe 4 standard for a total of 8 gigabytes per second, good enough for a PCIe-based M.2 storage solution, which is a nice bonus. Overall, a, a very uh, fast export solution, which will cater not only to extreme gamers, but also to GPU intensive users uh, in production environment and, and so stuff like that. So yeah, a very, very solid value here. Now, storage wise, I'll start with a five stick configuration, including a PCI 5.0 enabled one, which unsurprisingly received the bulk of the heat cooling attention with a very tall and dense heat tower plate. So all complemented with a double sided thermal pad situation since the PCI 5.0 standard being that fast can also get that hot. The other four sticks can all run up to PCIe 4.0 standard, which is plenty fast in my opinion and are cooled by a one and only single thermopadded massive heat plate, which can be a heating issue if you try to have a fully populated storage solution. And probably why Asus decided to provide an additional floor padding to the sticks most likely to suffer from a heat bleeding GPU. Now last good point, all of our M.2 solid set drives do have Asus very own scrollless locking mechanism they also did introduce three years ago. On the less gooder points, let me start with the kindest one. The heat plates are gorgeous, love them, but they are locked by screws. Now, how 2022 of you, Asus? I just published a review of two Aorus X motherboards, which featured screwless plates on motherboards starting at $300. You know, there's no excuse here for Asus. I'm sure they know about this feature, obviously, since it's already there with some other manufacturers, uh, but maybe they decided to implement it on the next generation of Asus motherboards, which I find completely unacceptable, especially when you're paying 700 bucks 
for motherboard, you do expect to, to get the latest and the best, which is not the case here. I find it, you know, lazy, very, very lazy from Asus. Now, my second not so good point is not so much about Asus, but more about Intel, the, the CPU slash chipset PCIe 5.0 lanes availability. We only have 16 PCIe 5.0 lanes. So what happens is we do on those kind of motherboards sometimes have very, very cruel PCIe bifurcations. And this one is particularly cruel. If you ever try to put a stick in there, any kind of stick, uh, well, your board is entirely transformed and an in-depth PCIe 5.0 bifurcation sends it straight back to Prime Pro abilities, since not only your second GPU export is now completely dead, but even the first one goes from 16 to 8 PCIe 5.0 lanes, robbing it completely from its future proofing abilities. Which again, it, you know, it's not exactly what's advertised. You really have to go into fine prints to know that, and I find it quite deceitful coming from Intel and Asus all together. Now, back AO-wise, first let me know the presence of our integrated plate, always reassuring. And starting from the left, we have our clear CMOS and flashback button for a CPU-less BIOS update, very nice, an HDMI output for integrated graphics, and two DisplayPort Type-C outputs, which can directly output our GPU signal, very, very nice. Four 5 gig plugs, six 10 gig plugs, including a Type-C, two Thunderbolt 4 plugs with an output up to a massive 40 gigs per second each. In contrast, uh, next we have a rather disappointing 2.5 gigabit LAN, which again, I find extremely lazy coming from Asus because its competition is either giving us five gigabit LAN or even five GBE, you know, with a speed modulation. Uh, a new generation of LAN outputs. I really don't understand why we're stuck with this. Uh, luckily, we do have an upgraded Wi-Fi 7, which is a first on Asus motherboards and, and obviously will bring you even closer to, say, fiber optic quality of internet over the air. That's great. There, there is a slight innovation uh, Asus tried to do here with their pushing Wi-Fi plugs, which, uh, okay, sure, you don't need to screw them uh, antennas anymore. And to be absolutely honest with you, it touched one without making the other one move. Very, very cool French uh, saying. Now, finally, we do have the premium all-digital ALC4082 uh, audio codec from Realtek, serviced by a healthy 500 microfarads of signal cleansing capacitors, coupled with a very good ES9218 quad DAC, which is notoriously good for its studio-graded recording abilities. So, especially interesting for the streamers out there. Now, overall, great bandwidth output, generous and versatile. But as connectivity goes, I find the LAN way below what other brands bring on the table at that price point, and we are finding ourselves with a legacy feature with a very, very updated pricing. Now, front panel connector-wise, aside from the usual legacy connectors and our two 5 gig connectors, we do have a dual channel Type-C offering up to 20 gigabit per second, nothing groundbreaking, but nevertheless adequate. Now, cooling-wise, well, we do have everything we need to operate either an air cooling configuration or an enthusiastically driven dual loop custom water cooling solution. The D5 water pumps are here, the flow sensors, the temp sensors, and obviously, and again, the EKWB monoblock add-on, which does transform the very CPU abilities of this motherboard. I love it. And finally, troubleshooting-wise, well, we do have a Maximus board here, and as such, it comes with a full load of troubleshooting features. We need to stay running all night. Starting with our first aid easy debugger for a vague hint of where our problem starts, but luckily refined by a very precise Q error code screen, which will tell you very clearly what the f you messed up this time. Now, we also have three soldered buttons, two of which are nicely backlitted and programmable. Uh, nothing to say here, just perfect. Now, in conclusion, the ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero will cost you 700 bucks before taxes, which is $90 more than its very own previous version, the ROG Maximus Z790 Hero. But this board has a more finished product with a, you know some innovative 
move, which I really appreciate, but we also have some legacy stuff remaining here. But luckily and fundamentally, it does also bring all the premium and power expectation that a board over $700 entails. And the way I see it, if you're going for a air-cooled system motherboard, this is definitely not what you want to go for. This will not bring you anything above the Strix or even the, the previous Z790 Hero. The only way I would motivate a buy, which is in my case, is if you're going to go for a fully custom water cooling system, coupled with an i9 processor and with an EKWB monoblock, and suddenly elevates it to compete against, you know, very, very premium motherboard, thousand dollar plus motherboards, and, and probably the combo I am going to go with, uh, uh, Z790 Dark Hero plus the EKWB monoblock, for, for my uh, brand new build, which by the way, I will be filming for your extreme pleasure.